The year was 2006. I was 29. I was a monitoring journalist at the BBC. I had just been promoted at work. Life was good. Uh, I lived a life where I did pretty much what I liked, still do. And um, I liked to look good back then. It was fun. My friends and my cousins were all getting married at a super fast pace. And so there was always a reason to look good. There was always a reason to have a new dress made or to have my nails done. So there was nothing unusual about that Saturday morning when I was at the salon getting my nails done. I didn't get it done today, by the way. <laughs> I didn't have time. A few days after the manicure, I noticed a little spot in the palm of my left hand, just a little spot. And I thought nothing of it. And a few days later, the spot began to itch, you know, like a sweet itch. You know, the more you scratch it, the more you want to scratch it. I still didn't think anything was wrong because, you know, I grew up in West Africa, and in West Africa, we say the palm of your hand is itching. It means you're about to receive Money, money, exactly. So there was no reason to be concerned. Well, until I noticed that everywhere I scratched turned black. And pretty soon, my whole palm was black. And the black spread to the, to the palm of my other hand. And right under the dark skin were weepy, scaly patches. So of course, in horror, I went to a dermatologist and I said, what is this? And that dermatologist referred me to a different dermatologist who put on a big pair of goggles that were magnifying, and he looked at my skin and he said, this is psoriasis, and it might spread to your feet. Now, I have lived with eczema for a long time, but I had never heard of psoriasis. I mean, what is that? And so I began to research this disease, research it and research it. This was the days before Safaricom Home Fiber, so I was researching it at work instead of working. And I found not very much. It's not clear what causes this disease. It's a very poorly understood disease. They think it's a condition of the, nerv of the, um, of the nervous system. It's not clear. All I do know is that it appears as terrible, ugly, weepy patches. It can turn up anywhere on, a, on one's body. Some people have it on their face. Some people are covered in it. You can even have it internally. How the disease manifested for me was on the palm of my hands only. I was able to do most things in a strange and adjusted way, but it was a new way to live um, having to do things in a strange way, having a compromised hands. I'd like you all to lift your hands and do this. Excellent. You're all able to do that because the skin in the palm of your hands is elastic. If you, look, if you have a look, the skin is elastic and that's how you're able to move your fingers. The skin and the elasticity in the palm of my hands disappeared as the disease progressed. So that every time I move my hands to pick up a pair of keys, to type, to get dressed, to open a door, to get anything, the skin broke open, which meant that the palms of my hands were covered in open sores. Everything I did, every time I drove, every time I, I interacted in any way, I did all those things in constant pain and a constant risk for infection. Aside from the discomfort of the disease was how socially isolating it was for me, me who enjoyed my social network so much. What do we do when we meet someone in our society? What's the first thing that we do? We shake, exactly. We shake people's hands, whether we've met them for the first time or whether we're seeing them for the 105th time. We shake their hand. But imagine extending that damaged, rough hand. People would shrink away from me, and that look of disgust on their face was a little much to take, especially when I had to explain over and over again what that was on my hand. My doctor said this was a very difficult condition to treat, and he was right. There were pills, there were topical applications, there were special preparations, and none of them worked. They looked like they might begin to work, and it looked like I might be out of the woods, and then the disease would come roaring back, and I'd be back at square one. So I have to tell you during this time that my, um, I had several battle companions. There was my mom, who's right there, <laughs> somewhere right there. My mom used to live in Tunisia at the time. 
And when she realized how bad my condition was, she flew into Nairobi just to be with me and to help me out and just to see how I was managing. She came armed with a pot of dead sea salts and holy water from a holy site in Tunisia. Her colleague had given her a little bit of holy water for me to use on my hands. My mom had told her about me. Just try it, she said. What have you got to lose? My sister came when my mother had to go back to work. My sister came with me. She was very supportive also. She came with me to my doctor's appointments and you know, generally tried to help me live. Um, my friends were also very supportive. You know, they would drive when I can be bothered to drive because it hurt. Those movements of driving suddenly became painful. And so they were really supportive. They did what they could to help me. But God was also on my side, planning things and moving things around and providing solutions, even though I wasn't aware of it. Here's how I know that. In this search for solutions, my doctor, it had been a year now of, of struggling with this disease back and forth with different remedies really working. And my doctor was now at the point where he was suggesting things like ultraviolet light therapy. I mean, we were in the realm of the experimental. I felt like a guinea pig. So one of the things he suggested was to put me on a medication called methotrexate. It's a fairly strong medicine where he would have to monitor my liver um, monitor my liver function. I didn't think anything of it. He'd been my battle companion up until this point. I had no reason to doubt his judgment. So I agreed very quickly, and I had the test done, and I was cleared to begin the treatment. At the time, I had an acquaintance, someone who has since left my life, because this is what God does. He moves people into your life sometimes for a very specific reason, to do a very specific job. She worked for the US government, and she had links to the Food and Drug Administration, which is the US body that approves medications that end up, for most of us, on the global market. She had a big encyclopedia on FDA-approved drugs, um, because this was the days, these were the days before Google became what it is. And she opened, I told her about my medication and, you know, what I was going to take, and she opened her encyclopedia of medications, and she found methotrexate, and she said, are you sure that you want to be on this medication? And I looked at the list of side effects, and apart from the usual ones, you know, diarrhea, headache, that's normal. Medicine is toxic, it's gonna give you something. It was the more extreme side effects that got my attention. Birth defects, but the potential of liver damage, and here's the one that really got me, potential hair loss. I had long straight hair at the time that I spent every weekend at, not every weekend. <laughs> every other weekend, I was at the salon every other weekend getting this hair primped and prepped for all the different things that I was going to at the time. And the idea of losing my hair, it's one thing to shave off your hair to make a fashion statement. It's a completely different thing to lose your hair to a medical treatment. I don't know, I wasn't gonna have that. And so for the first time, I was in a situation where I was going to have to confront my doctor and tell him that I didn't want to take his advice. This doctor who'd been with me for a full year trying all kinds of things. And that just made me tired. That just made me very, very exhausted. The idea that on top of dealing with this unsightly, difficult condition, I was now going to have to fight my doctor. I couldn't do it. One morning I woke up and I had a very con candid conversation with God. And I told God, I am very tired. I can't. I haven't complained all this time. I've done the best that I could. And if now I have to, on top of everything else, fight my doctor, I can't do it. You just have to do something about the situation. So on the appointed day, I went to my doctor's appointment. I turned up, and the doctor was getting his paraphernalia ready to start the treatment, as we'd agreed. And I decided, you know, the best way to say it is just to say it. So I just said, I don't want to be on this treatment. And he said, why not? I said, because of the side effects. And I told him what I had read. And he said, oh, don't worry. I'm going to put you on a very light dose, and I'm going to be watching, and it'll be fine. And then he had a sudden brainwave. He said, actually, let's try this other thing. And he put me on, and he gave me an injection. It was a steroid injection. And he said, you know, let's just see. Let's just see how that goes. And if it doesn't work, we'll do the methotrexate. So off I went. And can I tell you that for the first time in a year, 
it worked. The disease receded and went away and has never come back to that same intensity ever since. That was 13 years ago and I'm fully healed. I've been in remission. Thank you, I've been in remission for 13 years. So what was the lessons learned from this experience? Am I telling you to never have a manicure? <laughs> I've had many manicures since that time and I've not re-triggered the disease. It's possible that it was there before and I didn't notice it. I learned that if you're sick enough for long enough, you will look for healing anywhere that you can find it. While I was looking for, while my doctor was looking for solutions and I was looking for solutions, one of the things that I thought was to take a trip to Israel to soak in the Dead Sea because I had heard that people had found healing. People with chronic skin conditions had found healing from soaking from the minerals in the Dead Sea. That made perfect sense to me. I would have done it too if I'd been sick for longer. I learned that the WHO released a report um, that puts the global prevalence rate of this disease at 11.4%. That's more than one out of 10 people. As you move through your day today, think about it. One out of every 10 or 11 person you meet has this disease. That's a lot of people. And yet it doesn't get any attention. And how I know that is that there's not a lot of information about what causes this disease. That means that there are, no, there are not enough research dollars being directed towards it. Um, it's not one of the sexy four. It's not HIV, it's not Ebola, it's not malaria, it's not TB. So there's not enough research going towards it and there's definitely no TV cameras. There's no, t there's no news coverage of this illness. Add to that the fact that it is non-communicable and it's not life-threatening and you have a disease that is just not a priority, it seems, for the medical community. There is now a psoriasis um, Association of Kenya. There wasn't when I was, uh, when I was struggling with the disease. Um, I don't know how big the membership is, but I do know that there needs to be more associations like it helping sufferers reduce each other's stress. As, as treatments fail, this disease can make you feel ugly, it can make you feel damaged, and you can feel despondent. And we know that despair doesn't go very far without her close friend depression. We need to help to get together and help each other lower our stress because we know that stress exacerbates this condition. I also learned from that experience that me and my family, we fight a lot. We disagree about everything under the sun. But when it really matters, we band together for each other, and I'm grateful for that. But I also learned that God is everywhere and that God looks after us even when you don't think he's doing anything, even when we're asking why. Without God, I would be methotrexate bald.